in one hand we are French band because uh, we we live in France and uh, we are French but uh, in in another hand we we d we don't care really much about the the French culture I mean we have it but we don't want to spread it all around the world we um we just feel a, a little bit different in France and we 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 are listening to some uh, other other music like uh of course, we know a lot about like uh, French music, but we wanted to to do something more European and some and somebody and something more like uh, from the world. You can only be a newcomer once in your life, and it's the same with an audience. And so, uh, the more we tour, we try to discover new countries all the time, just to keep it fresh and to play somewhere for the first time. When we work on side projects, we always want to work on something different and something new, something like, like a new experience for us. So, um, for example, after Virgin Suicide, we, we were not specialized, we didn't specialize ourselves into soundtracking music. And so we did this thing with uh, Alessandro Barrico, or we do work with uh, Xavier Veillon, or with Angela Prage de Cache for ballet. So each time we do a side project between each album, we, we try to do something we never done before. So I think doing this project with um, George Melies is something, it's a unique experience and, uh, because it's a unique movie and we never did that with before. Like making music for a silent movie has nothing to do with uh, scoring a, a, classic, a normal movie. So it was, uh, we didn't know before we tried if it would be a good idea or not until we heard the first sounds, you know. We knew George Melies before because we knew uh, like everyone, we knew this uh, iconic image uh, with the, the, um, the rocket hitting the moon. And seriously, I think we did it because, uh, because of the quality of the movie itself, because it's, it's, uh, it, it's a movie made to amuse people. You know, it's, uh, the idea was like how to entertain people and uh, the movie is, uh, has been made because of the, um, all the books of Jules Verne and H.G. Uh, Wells. And uh, behind the movie there is this uh, idea about moving away and flying away from Earth. And uh, through this idea you can see like all the colonial attitude <laughs> of the people at this time. So it's, uh, I think it's really entertaining. It's, it's, uh, it's full of... Uh, a fun actually it's just like it's not it's not serious this movie is just like for fun i really like a uh, science fiction books like from this time from the beginning of the century and even before because you you um, it's so uh, it's basic it's really basic and it's really funny to see like the vision of the future by these uh, people at this time and uh, i think that uh, they were totally wrong but also totally right for example uh, like the, the the shape of the starship, it's looking a little bit like Apollo, you know. There is like the same kind of, uh, I mean, basic maybe you know, uh, Apollo and all the NASA have recreated in real what we had in mind. Maybe there was um, other ways to approach the moon than uh, doing a starship like that. And to uh, the un the entire concept of going to the moon was like uh, following maybe the the human being imagery about this time, about the books, and maybe science fiction books are showing the way for reality. It was a working, a working pro process, work in progress around the world. Uh, we had, um, it was not the final step of uh, restoration, it was just the step before. So basically, all the original colors images were there and the images that were missing, they were replaced by black and white uh, images. So they didn't do the transfer of, uh, uh, they didn't scan the colors to put them on the black and white. So we had kind of a half and half version. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was enough to see the trip because uh, each scene we, we could see the original colors. And even if sometimes they were switching to black and white, we still could feel the vibe. We were watching the images, but uh, there's something funny about the movie that, um, we didn't catch it, and we 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 try to do something more emotional. So, and also, we tr we could see the image, but also the background of the image. And like for us, uh, 
as JB said before, when they discover the moon, I don't think it's a great thing. I think it makes it made me sad a little bit because it reminds me the end of innocence and when the white man arrives somewhere and destroys everything. So it's kind of melancholic for me also, this music. And the, mu the movie is supposed to be funny, but it's kind of uh, for us with the look of 2012, it's not funny. I mean, just to arrive somewhere and just to hit someone b before talking to him or something like that. It was pretty, it was pretty, yeah, it's a good uh, testimony of, of uh, history and to see uh, what uh, Europe's mind towards uh, uh, Africa or Asia. Or it, it's a good example of what we thought about what we were supposed to do over there. Are we obsessed by space and being lost in space and and uh, have no weight. And, uh, so it was kind of cool to explore that, that vibe and also to explore the real aspect of the moon. Like the moon is something where there's a lot of rocks and volcanoes. And I think many has the moon as a, it's a fantasy vision, but then there's the real moon. And I think the rest of the album is more about the real moon. We used uh, uh, female vocals because we were searching for a different sound. And also, uh, bec it's because also they are really melancholic and sad. I mean, uh, some uh, Au Revoir Simon's songs are very, very, uh, very sad, very melancholic. And we decided to do this music. And that music is really like, it's a sort of a, a you know, a magical uh, childhood song. Uh, but the melody is a little bit horrible. The melody is has something like uh, from a tell, you know, it's, it, it sounds like a, horrible uh, witch tale, you know, something like that, and I I really love that. And uh, it's just to, to do something different and to explore a different of uh, dark sound. We use the organic sounds and uh, we use all instruments like the Mellotron. That's the instruments they used to have in uh, in theaters or in uh, in the radio in the old days to uh, simulate uh, when, you, when you do plays in the radio. They do the noises with that and stuff like that. And uh, so we didn't use any CD bank or whatever. We wanted to be faithful to um, the spirit of uh, Georges Méliès and the fact, the handcraft and handmade um, technique that he was using for his movie. That we, we really want not to betray that. Psychoacoustic thing is uh, about like um, uh, the, the, the bass waves are reaching a certain part of your body, more like in the stomach. And the trebles are reaching more like the, the brain, or, and I think that we are really um, into emotion, and that's why sometimes our music is on the edge. It's on the edge to be a little bit bad taste. Sometimes it's, it can be like cheesy, it can be a um, little bit like easy listening, but uh, or too dark sometimes, or too depressing. But we we need to surf on this wave. Otherwise, there's no emotion. Well, as a matter of fact, everything starts in London. Uh, it was quite an adventure at the time. You know, cinema uh, was quite new. We're not in 1902, but when George Melies is 20 years old, he's to be sent to London to learn English, which is not very unusual for French people, and also business. What he will learn is not well, maybe English. I think he was speaking quite good English. We had found very good documents about that. But he learned not business, but magic. He didn't go very much to the industry of his parents' uh, shoemaking um, industry. But he was attending on a very regular basis the Egyptian Hall, which was the very best place for magic in London. So he learns magic, not business. He learns magic with um, uh, the most famous magicians of that time. At the time, it was uh, they were named Masquer Masquerade, uh, Cook, David Devant, people that you wouldn't know today. But he learns magic, and that will have a key impact on his career. What we will see is very much impacted on that. The second meeting with London is not well. It's very important, actually. 
He discovers cinema in 1895 in Paris with the, uh, what we call the, uh, well, the very beginning of cinema. English will not agree on that because the inventions were, uh, there were many inventions at that time, but the Lumiere made this famous projection in Paris, in Café de Paris, near Opera. And um, George attends this um, screening, well, because it's a screening, that's the, uh, the 1 zero, the, the very beginning of the cinema. But the Lumiere won't sell him the device. They won't sell him because they want to make business also. Uh, they're not artists in the way. Um, they, they're going to shoot the um, trains and that, well, the reality uh, scenes in the street and everything. So what does Malias? He goes to London again because he knows London. He speaks English at least. And he goes to a certain Robert William Paul and he buys a projector. And this projector, he's going to turn it into a camera. That's six months, no, that's uh, four months after the cinema begins. And he turns his projector into a camera. And then he's going to shoot, shoot, shoot again. 500 films. <laughs> 520, to be more precise. Um, so that's a very strong link with London. And we're very happy here to share this rediscovery of a one of his major film. I'll come back to that later. But um, you have to understand that magic will be very important in his life. And what we'll see today is a very interesting um, piece of magic that he would do on stage, like in a theatre, not with a cinema, but he would do that on stage before, and then he will do it with the cinema. And now I will leave the floor to Jill, explain you what Trip to the Moon is such an incredible film. Why um, Trip to the Moon is a key film in the cinema story. At the time and today, we are in 1902 and it's, uh, it's been six years George Méliès shoots film. And Trip to the Moon is the most complete film of Méliès at the time. This is a super production because um, this is a huge project and incredible sets painted by George Méliès himself at the floor. Um, more than uh, in the trip to the moon you have more than 20 characters. This is very exceptional for this time. Um, this is a long feature film uh, at this time because uh, this is a more than 260 meters so, by the way, this is the first science film, uh, science, sorry, science fiction film. And the first film, this is the first film uh, pre-rated and plagiarized. I'm sorry for my English. Plagiarized. Again, plagiarized. <laughs> In one world, uh, Trip to the Moon is the first blockbuster. Everybody, everybody knows. Um, now, um, the rocket in the eyes of the moon, and still today. So, Severin? But yep. it was a blockbuster, but um, what um, everybody doesn't know is that uh, it also existed in color. Melies wanted to shoot films, well, since the beginning of cinema, when he discovered there was an artist, well, actually, he was frustrated because he wanted color. He was... Um, he wanted to film, uh, to shoot theories and uh, long stories and everything we like, like he would do on stage. And then he met a certain person called Mrs. Tullier. She's in Paris and she's coloring, she's a colorist for photographic business. But she's an artist. And he goes to her and says, what you can do for photography, you can do for films, except it's going to be like 14,000 frames for the trip to the moon. Uh, 14,000 frames is that big. So she will use up to 200 ladies specialized in one color. One would be in, in red and, or pink or green. And they would color with a brush, frame by frame, <laughs> to give the color to George Melies' movies. So that would cost a lot. So he wouldn't do that for all the films. But it was like a fantasy. You know, he would he really want to say, okay, I can shoot films. That's good, but it's not enough. Maxim Gorky, who saw films in Russia, said, okay, this is great cinema, but it, 
it's really, really dull. It's all gray and black. This is boring. This is, this is dull. This is not the reality. This is not fantasy. This is so George, George Melies, in a way, is that way. So he's going to make a trip to the moon in color. 14,000 frames, one by one, painting with his brush. But the tricky thing is that this color version, we knew it existed, and uh, we knew it thanks to the BFI. I know many BFI people are in the, in the room today because there are catalogs that were preserved, and we discovered that the film was presented black and white and color. So it was, it was existing since the beginning. But this color version had disappeared, like many, many other films of George Melies. And thank God it was found in Spain in the 1990s, and then it's a long story, like a 12 years adventure. It's gonna be found in Spain, but then meticulously restored, I would say, uh, restored, sorry. And that we, we would go back to the 1902 business, like frame by frame, <laughs> because it was in two fragments, because the, you know, all of you know that the time damaged the films and everything. So it was in two pieces, actually. It was more than that. And so what you're going to see today is really amazing because it's one of the most famous film that you've never seen in color. And believe me, the color, I understand George Melies, who conceived his film in black and white and also in color, it gives a new dimension. It's like uh, all his special effects. He's the inventor of special effects and he would give a new dimension like you could compare like from a 2D to a 3D. It gives a new dimension to that, and that's how we came, you know, to with this amazingly restored film that everybody knows, but nobody knows in color. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, when we discovered that we could do this, and it took a long, long time, uh, we thought, oh God, 15 minutes, how are we going to circulate the film <laughs> around the world? Like, like George Melies used to do that. He would circulate that in New York, London, Berlin. So we had the idea that um, we couldn't play the film with a live orchestra or live piano, just like at the time. It's not very convenient in Cannes Film Festival or other festivals. So we thought we have to record something. We have to make an original soundtrack for that. So we came to see two gentlemen. We knocked at the door. <laughs> well, actually, we, well, yeah, the gate crashed the door. <laughs> And we, we say, okay, well, do you know Melies? And so yes, we do know Melies. And we asked them, would you do the original soundtrack for this and to accompany the film like worldwide and give him a new life and make, you know, new audience to see that? And it was a, a yes, a yes at the very beginning because it was, I have to mention that it's not a very, it's not a detail, is it on a voluntary basis? And they had a very little time to do that because at the time we were notified that the Cannes Film Festival would open the film. We're not sure about that, but the Cannes Film Festival was very thrilled about that. So we said, you have a month, you have no money. Would you do that? So yes, okay. Well, we were quite surprised, quite impressed. And I think they locked, <laughs> they locked themselves for the four weeks and they did this um, marvelous uh, music that is really, I think, in the spirit of George Melies, I think would have thought it. I mean, George Melies was making films and then would give it to the audience with a kind of a freedom for the music. So the, they would play Air à la Mode, that was the uh, fashion in tunes, and um, it's not the reason why we chose them. But um, I think it, they did a marvelous job. What you're going to see is so is in color with an original soundtrack by Air. We're very pleased to present it here again, like we presented other films <laughs> in the Institut Francais. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, I work for NME magazine, and I'm just here to ask a few questions of Jean Benoit and Nicola of Air, who I'd like to welcome on stage. Hello. <laughs> Um, how did this compare to previous soundtrack work you've done before, obviously, <coughs> you know, with Sofia Coppola and The Virgin Suicides is quite well known? Uh, the movie maker is dead, so, <laughs> so he, was not, uh, he was not here to complain or to ask for 
going faster, so it was a good thing. No, but, uh, but this movie uh, is, a, is a silent movie, so there is plenty of room for the music. And, um, and so the, the narration and the, the emotion has to be driven by the sound. And uh, also there was no sound design on it, so we had to incorporate the, the sounds, like the, the noises and the sound design into the music. So um, it was really original, really. And um, what were some of the techniques you used that maybe you hadn't used before, new techniques or instruments to try and capture some of those narrative elements to the soundtrack? Um, we used, um, I mean, you know, uh, when we showed the movie in Cannes, some I was in a party at night and, uh, <laughs> and there was a, a guy there and he was uh, telling about uh, what he saw during the day. And he said, yeah, I saw this movie of Melies and uh, I really didn't like the, the music at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, ah, yeah, and, uh, and why? He said, because uh, I was expecting like some, uh, you know, some piano and some, some violins, some strings, like the, the music at this of this time. And, uh, but uh, I thought that uh, w we wanted to do the contrary, we wanted to do something modern something uh, new something new something shocking with uh, uh with a lot of, of different acoustic sounds with some uh, electronic keyboards with some uh, computers and um, we wanted to you know to use our studio but uh, in all the directions like uh we wanted to be extreme and um and because we are doing pop music with songs and with voices and with uh this kind of uh, structure, the same structures of the time. We wanted to do something uh, completely um, free from all the, um, the structures of the music that we have experimented before. So, um, so that was a challenge, you know, to use like some really modern and new, different uh, kind of sounds. We just uh, pass over to Nicola for a minute. I believe um, I read you saying somewhere that you, it was important on your work in the sound soundtrack to make it very organic and live sounding. Yes, we wanted to be faithful to the spirit of George Melies because um, it was a very handmade and um, very organic way of working. He was, uh, he was building everything um, from A to Z and it was, um, so we didn't want to, um, to do the easy way and um, we, we, like, we built the sounds uh, and um, we wanted to keep this, uh, in français we say fabriquer à la maison like uh, and not something uh, made in a prefab sub sounds somewhere, even for the noises and the sound design. And um, we use very uh, we have, we used old old tools, and uh, so we made everything ourselves. Usually, um, we could have used like a sound engineer or, or a producer or a mixer. We didn't do that. We wanted to to do the music the two of us like like uh, Georges Méliès was making his movie, really. It sounds like a, a very intense experience, having that short of a time to do it in, and such an important work of early cinema, knowing it was going to be shown at Cannes. Was it, did you feel the pressure a lot? Or I mean, it looks like, also looks like it was quite fun to do. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of pressure because of, um, of Cannes, actually. And uh, we knew that uh, Scorsese and Woody Allen Will be th would be there, and so, um, wow. But uh, we need that now, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when you're a musician, uh, you know, you, 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 you we need the pressure. It's like, uh, we need excitement. And um, so uh, I'm searching for that. But um, no, but the only, also there was a, another kind of pressure. It was about the, um, this famous scene with uh, the moon like the, the rocket hitting the moon, and you can see like uh, the moon hurts. And uh, it's an, a very important I icon for the history of cinema and even for the mankind, actually. Everyone knows uh, this uh, picture, and so um, I was saying to myself, how, how, can we do, how can we do that? I mean, what kind of sound can we put on, on it? And uh, I was, uh, uh, we were uh, almost ready to not put anything, to, <laughs> to let the scene with uh, some silence. And we, we found this, uh, this kind of uh, chords and these dramatic sad chords. And as soon as we had that, 
I was uh, I was pleased and uh, I said to myself that the it w the, the bet was won. I mean that we we had found something, and after that it was cool to finish. Um, why have you decided to expand the soundtrack into a, a full album, and how does it differ from the original soundtrack we've just heard? Um, at, at when the last image stopped, we were frustrated. Uh, we say, oh my god, w are we just getting into it? And now it has to stop. It's like, uh, you know what I mean? So um, we decided to um, to uh, go on for the trip. I think uh, the the... The two sides of a vinyl, vinyl album uh, is the perfect format for going on a trip uh, in, the, in the music uh, environment. And I think um, 40 years of, uh, of, uh, of this format uh, got us to get used to that, uh, that journey and that length. So uh, 14 minutes, it was definitely too short. And um, we used, um, we know we made a lot of albums since the last 12 or 13 years. So we are familiar with the with the LP format, and uh, so we know how to tell a story in uh, in 35 or 40 minutes. We that's that's what that's how we grew up, and that's what we learn. That's what we know what to do in a studio. So and also, <coughs> maybe yes, as a fantasy vision of the moon, uh, 1902 vision of the moon. But uh, we have also um, the moon exists in real. I mean, we see it in the sky every day, and so we wanted to compose some music that express a more contemporary idea about the moon and about um, being uh, lost in space. And um, we wanted to get away a little bit from the, the movie itself to express our position uh, with space and, uh, and this something much more uh, realistic. And uh, some, uh, some songs like Moon Fever, uh, express this idea of having no weight. And uh, it's a theme uh, we work on it for a long time. It's a fa very familiar for us. We are obsessed by the moon and space, and we are obsessed by having no weight. I don't know why. Maybe, uh, I don't know. I was too fat when I was a child or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was, uh, going back to the original soundtrack, what was it most important for you that the music should bring out or emphasize in the film? Um psychedelism and magic because of uh, George Melies. He was a magician and uh, it was important to get this, uh, this feeling of uh, you know, uh, getting away from, uh, from Earth and, um, and uh, also uh, we felt that the fact that the pictures were recolorized it was uh, reminding us um, the Sgt. Pepper cover. So we had in mind, like, okay, Sergeant Pepper, so we can do something really, really different with a slow tempo tracks and up tempos, and something really like psychedelic with a lot of delays. And we you know I will. I like when um, you hear something, you hear a piece of music, and you don't know the the way it has been done, how it has been recorded. And I like when I, I my brain can't identify. What I what I hear, and I think it's uh, generally in a piece of art. When I understand, I mean, when I can see how the guy did to to re to do his uh, his painting or his art, it's less uh, interesting. Uh, <coughs> we wanted to to be to to do something really surprising and not uh, and mysterious actually. Have you, uh, just lastly, before I hand it over to the floor, um, did you uh, ever wonder what Melies would have thought of the soundtrack, if he could hear it? Oh, I think, um, I think he would have liked it for one reason, um, because he was make this kind of movie to entertain people. And I think um, the music helped um, to see that movie with a lot of pleasure. And you don't, before, when it was in black and white with no music, as a child, I was uh, looking at it and I say, "Okay, th it's a piece of museum," and um, and with the colored and with the music, you you forgot it's from 1902. You f you just have a good moment for 40 minutes. You have you have fun, and that's what it was uh, trying to reach. So um, I think he would have uh, been uh, happy with the music. I mean, I hope so. There was no music made for that movie because he, he has no. Um, he has no precise idea of what to play on the top of it. He was selling the movie to um, to the theaters or 
to the fair and he was telling just play the music of the fashion music of the time you know so he didn't really care that's why we accepted to do that because we didn't feel we were betraying either a composer or betraying um, a masterpiece we 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 didn't uh, replace the original music but by our music and that was the main um, reason why we accepted to uh, to put music on the top of it otherwise I would have never dared um, to change something that has been made already before me you know so it was a, it would have been a lack of respect uh, I would hate if people would do that with my records in 100 years I think maybe in 50 years from now another band could do music because it would be the same uh, process because there was no original music uh, for that movie so I think everyone, every new generation could still make the music alive and, and keep the, the film alive as a, as a living experience. The movie is uh, made by uh, different, uh, how do you say, uh, like different moments and Méliès was inspired by uh, theaters. I mean, he, was, uh, he had a theater and so the movie basically is like um, some following scenes and um, the real beginning, the, real, the first scene, uh, it was, it has been, it's really long actually, and it has been made um, for a presenter to, to talk about the, the movie and to say, oh, now you're gonna watch a movie, and um, it deals with the moon, and it has been made by uh, Georges Méliès, and this is a projector, this is a camera, and uh, blah, blah, blah. So that's why it's really long. And uh, after that, you know, uh, I think the movie, uh, it takes a long time to really begin and the action is kind of like uh, we, are, we are expecting something and uh, the music is the same so uh, the music is like it, it's, it's good but it's um, it's like suddenly you know we, we enter into the, the piece of art of, uh, what, of the movie but uh, the, the first real thing uh, the first real um, moment musically the strong moment is when the you see the moon and like the uh, with the, like the the starship going into the um, on target. So uh, the start the, the start is really here. But uh, me, I prefer. I said to myself, yeah, we did something good when um, you have like the the hunt when they are on the moon and uh, you have the aliens uh, that are hunting them. And I, I like this scene because because the music is really uh, psychedelic. I like the solo and uh, the crazy uh, sort of prog jazz aspect that we have at this time. And uh, it's really fun also, you know, the, the action is really, is really fast and it's fun, it's, uh, it's full of energy, <coughs> full of humor also, so I thought that uh, the music was good at, at this point. The idea um, is to do the opposite of uh, Walt Disney. Like, he, Walt Disney was... Um, filming some animals and they were talking with human voices. And um, here we have human beings and we wanted to make them talk with the animal sounds because um, it was uh, when this guy arrived and he has this original idea to go on the moon and uh, he, he, he draws what he's going to do and then he looks in his back and he saw all these people making fun of him. And um, I felt sorry for him at this point. And um, this is uh, when you have an original ID in, uh, in your life, everybody is always against you and tell you it's not going to be possible. And um, so there's always kind of this farm, farm sounds for me, like a chicken, you know? This is the kind of sounds that I, I was fed up to hear that when I was younger, especially when you're in, uh, when we were in France and we knew we could do something good in music, which was not obvious because in this country the music is terribly terrible. And uh, I, always, uh, I always thought I was a pioneer, you know? And um, so I felt very connected with that. And um, I really wanted to hear the, the, the chicken and the farm noise that, that buzzing in my mind when I was younger. And just, I was fed up of all these people just always nya, 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 like that. It was very boring. And, um, and also, um, I'm a big fan of uh, Trevor Horn and um, on, uh, on, on Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, there's a lot of jungle sounds and comes from a, a, the first sampler ever called the Fairlight. And I grew up with this kind of sounds and uh, so it's, it was very important for me to have these sounds in the, 
in the film. So there's really three reasons why there is animal sounds in, in, in this movie. And uh, yes, of course, is he, you know, um, I didn't see his, uh, his movie about George Melies. Um, I'm, I, it just released next Wednesday in Paris, so, and, um, so that's it. But um, I know these people are so, uh, Scorsese is so into um, uh, the history of cinema, so we knew we had a lot of pressure from uh, these kind of guys like uh, Scorsese or Tim Burton or uh, George Lucas or, or um, uh, what's his name, the guy from the Monty Python, uh, Terry Gilliam. I know uh, for them, um, uh, George Melies' work is, uh, was very inspiring and uh, we knew we were touching s something very like uh, sacré. I don't know the word in English. So we were, uh, we were kind of scared of their reaction. I still don't know if they, li if they like it or not. I know uh, uh, Allen, I hope he didn't fall asleep, but yeah, I know he was there. <laughs> And uh, that's, uh, I know at some point he was very tired, but I don't know if it was doing his, his own movie or, 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 or this one. I, I, I don't I have no recollection of, I was so stage fright that uh, uh, I was kind of, uh, I lost track of what happened that night. Sincerely, I, did, I was not uh, especially into Georges Méliès, but um, I mean, uh, for me, uh, when I was a child, I was watching television and um, I saw these pictures somewhere. It was in my mind, it was also in my dream. And uh, I think that we, we felt a strong connection with Georges Méliès because uh, himself, he was totally into uh, old science fiction books. And uh, I know that he, he has been inspired by H.J. Uh, Wells and uh, also Jules Verne, and uh, we, we have read we have read all these books too, and um, you know uh, we are doing a lot of promo right now um, about this album, and and people say, oh yeah, but you, it was the second time that you've done a, a movie about the, the moon, so why 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 what do you have with the moon? And I think that um, when we found the Moon Safari album title we were reading uh, The Chronicles of Mars of Robert Burry and uh, it's old science fiction too so I think that we I mean the common the common work is about like uh, you know uh, dreaming about this uh, these visions these old visions of uh, of science fiction and uh, and myself you know I was like totally into uh, into this and it was I mean it was part of my dreams also so um, I don't know, I felt a strong connection with that. Mm. Blockbusters are strange. I remember uh, when I saw Star Wars when I was a child and I'd say, okay, this is great. And I always thought I was the only one to have thought it was great. And then I realized the whole planet uh, really uh, thought it was amazing. So it's kind of, uh, I was disappointed. And, uh, so I think, yeah, um, Blockbusters is a, is a paradox because uh, you feel like it's your thing, you grew up with something, with it in your heart, and then you realize that it's not very original. <coughs> so um, this thing is the same thing with, the, with George Minier's movie, and I think the, um, the image of the rocket in the moon is a more, even more famous than the movie, and it hides the emotional power of the movie and um, so what was interesting to do with the music is to get away from the the blockbusters aspect of it with the with the rocket in the eye and to go uh, uh, to reveal some emotions that has have been ha hidden for so many years because of this image that's so famous so I think uh, the idea with the music is to reveal uh, a new identity for the movie because uh, uh, for 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 so many times, the only mov the movie was just resumed to one image, and the idea with the music is to bring life to the other images, and um, so that's the fame. The fame we we try to de to develop something on the side of the fame of the of the movie. We were born around this time, like in August 1969, I think, 
And uh, yeah, so I, some people uh, think that it has been shoot, sh shot by uh, Stanley Kubrick actually, but uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we went on the moon. And uh, I, yeah, I know it's crazy. Why, why did we do that? I, I don't know. What for? Um, but um, yeah, we we had that in mind. Uh, but when you said, um, you know, is, you said composing the music, and each time uh, I uh, I hear this word composing, compose is uh, really to um, put some elements together, and uh, the elements that you put together are already existing, and uh, you are credited as a composer, but actually you are just uh, a transformer, and uh, I think that you know when you think about this uh, concept about the fact to transform something into something else, it's um, you carry less weight of uh, of pressure, you know. And um, so I don't know. Uh, I know that when uh, during the real moon landing uh, on the BBC, I think that uh, it's. Uh, they were uh, synchronizing the song of David Bowie uh, that, that we all like, and uh, I was thinking about that too, about this kind of sound. And uh, the story is that he, he used the same kind of instrument that we used on the movie, the, the Mellotrons, and that's why you, we used a lot of these kind of pads, like these uh, sort of fake string sounds, and um, so it was like the the relationship between the two. It was strange because when they land on the moon, they, and we were born just after that, and so we grew up with the idea that it's going, it's going to go further. And then when we will be um, adults, um, people will, will, will live on the moon, and uh, nothing really happened. So this whole thing, uh, we were so disappointed because we grew up with this idea of it's going gonna, it's gonna to go more and more like that, that we will build space shuttles, and. Uh, we will live in the cities, in the in the planets, and um, after that, it will be the, the first the first step of a, a whole um, a whole story with us and space. And um, then uh, nothing really happened after that. So we were uh, we it's like a broken dream, and um, we are very sad about that because uh, it's like um, when we were children. That's what we have been told that when in the year two thousand. It will be the future with um, space spaceships and laser guns and 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 nothing really happened. Uh, we just have the iPad now and that's it. And, <laughs> and uh, so I got these apps where you can see planets, and uh, so I look at them on my iPad and that's all what I got now. And uh, so it's kind of um, it's kind of sad. So now I found a guy. He, he builds houses under the sea, and so I think that's my next thing. I know. I will not be able to live on the moon one day, but I will maybe I have a chance to have a house under the water, which for me it's it is the same experience because in the water you have no weight also. So this is my obsession, you know. This is my goal, and um, so I think what I cannot have in the sky, I will have it under the sea. I think we are never satisfied. We are not like uh, I mean, first <laughs> in Paris we are a little bit depressed, and when. Um, when I uh, when we finished that, I was really doubtful. I was thinking, oh yeah, it's not. Uh, there's no songs. There's no. There's no hits. Uh, it's too long. Um, the music is like uh, strange sometimes. So we we're never satisfied. And um, I think that all the artists are like that. They are never satisfied. And uh, you know the problem with um, when you are a band. That suddenly you 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 see yourself successful, and uh, you pass your your time to explain to the newspaper uh, how how you would like to be loved because you are always presented in uh, in the bad way. For example, the the photographs that you have in the of yourself in the press are always the, the worst. Uh, you see uh, like. Uh, the interviews, like the the words that you've said, and each time you you read what you've said, it, you you say to yourself, "Oh, but it, it, it sounds stupid." I mean, uh, <laughs> people are gonna call me on my mobile and say, "I'm you're a stupid guy," and you doesn't make sense. And uh, it's always the same with like uh, when you do music. 
I feel that there are some good moments and uh, there are some good parts of it, but some, sometimes I say, oh no, it's not uh, good enough. But we, uh, we only had f uh, one month, so, um, so it's a pretty good job for one month, but, uh, but uh, I mean, I think that the music we've done is good in, this, in the sense that it's a lot of uh, energy. I mean, it's really uh, energetic. It's really like, uh, you know, it's really, uh, there was a positive, uh, energy in it because of the the drums and the the beats and uh but i don't know i mean i, I will know in um, in ten years if it's good or or, or bad what we, what we've done and uh actually i'm really surprised because uh, i can see like you know on the internet you can see on the blogs what people feel about the movie and about, about the music and they they seem to really enjoy it so so I, I'm, it's good Yes, when we finished and um, we brought the music to a professional mixer and um, he tried to mix, this, he started mixing the song and it was actually, it, so he fixed all the mistakes that we did because for us we wanted to do everything ourselves to, to be faithful to uh, George Media Spirits, the handmade uh, process. And uh, when, uh, when the song started to be mixed and I said to myself, this is not, uh, this is, yeah, this is not the right way to do things. It's too good, too pro, too nice. And um, I think uh, if we, if we, we should go back to the to the raw version. And um, so, but then the price to pay for that is that when I hear the music, I hear all the mistakes, and uh, I knew something could be improved. And uh, I know I use timpanis, and sometimes they're too loud, and they go over everything. And but we wanted to keep this this homemade. Uh, um, process so but because of that I still have some t my stomach hurts when I hear the music because I, there's some stuff that's really it's not right but uh, that's the way he was making his movies you know and I, I didn't I didn't want to do something uh, too professional so that's why it's, I'm happy when it was finished that we made it and it's not it works with the movie but as a musician I, I still have, um, I don't think I can listen to the music uh, at home, or it's too, it's too horrible moment for me. We could do um, another soundtrack, but you know, we never ask for anything, and uh, we are waiting, we are expecting somebody to ask, and uh, so uh, I don't know. Sometimes we have some uh, good requests, but uh, you know, I, we are really picky actually. Yeah. We are very difficult. <laughs> and, and also, making a soundtrack is a job. It's like, okay, now, you know, we, we have a career, we, have, we go on tour, we make our own albums, and making a soundtrack is like you work for someone, basically. And the fact uh, that um, you, you're going you're gonna to have 10 people breaking your balls all the time, telling you what to do, and, and changing the edit, and, and you have, we have a neurotic director who would say, uh, oh, you do, yeah, my movie, my movie, my movie, you know, stuff like that. And um, then you have all the producers who give their opinion and we, we want to change the music. And sometimes some piece of, of the film will not be good enough and they will ask the movie to make a miracle, like makeup on a horrible face or something. And um, so it's like, uh, if you want to do that, you say, okay, this is going to be my life, this is going to be my job, I know this is, this is how things work. And I, I'm not sure we, we like to do that, really. And um, so, um, because we, uh, yeah, but uh, and also that's it. So, and also all the side projects that we do, we don't like to repeat ourselves, which means uh, we accepted to do this thing because it was kind of a, an amazing project. I'm not sure uh, there was something quite as amazing for a long time after that because it was a very intense uh, experience also.